hopefully he'll be joining us very, very soon. I hope you guys have all had an uh, incredible Sunday and we just watched Chasing the Sun, the penultimate episode. And it's all about this pack, all about that mega mall and the likes of this man that joins us now. Springbok Centurion, 117 tests and a Rugby World Cup medal to boot. So very good evening to you, Tendai. Beast. Good evening, How are boys. you? How are you doing? <laughs> good to see I'm you. I'm very, very good. It's really good to see you too. How, how's retired life treating you? No, retired life is very interesting. Um, I must say, you know, the next chapter after rugby is quite challenging, you know. <laughs> so our life for me has been quite... Uh, Obviously, a um, smooth transition. I'm involved in in a, in a business, security business, and I'm also studying. Uh, yeah, and I'm also running my foundation now, so I'm quite busy. So I haven't really had much time to miss rugby. <laughs> so yeah, it's been great, you know, in that fact. That's really, really good. What are you studying? So I'm starting towards an MBA. Um, uh, I'm starting with any business school. I'm currently doing a postgraduate diploma uh, that will be um, finishing next year. Then I'll start my MBA program in May. So, yeah, it's quite uh, it's quite something. I, like, you know, I was used to using my physical abilities. Now I'm having to use my brain, you know, uh, for, yeah, pretty much 99% of the times. <laughs> but it's fun. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a real switch, isn't it? A real switch. Um, but what a great episode, uh, episode four of Chasing the Sun was. And um, I think people just don't understand the level of preparation and the level of work that goes into uh, a World Cup. You know, we saw all the work that was done during the group stages, but Japan... It, it, it was a brand. It was a brand new opposition that you had to chase. Also, a new challenge in the fact that they were hosting it. They got the whole nation behind them. They got the neutrals behind them. How difficult was that week to the Japanese quarterfinal? No, it was. Uh, it was a very tough week. You know, um, you know the fact that it matters. That you know the Japanese they were incredible to us. You know, because we were the first team. You know, to get to to Japan. So they went out of their way to make us feel comfortable and they were so hospitable. And I think, yeah, we, we, we were thoroughly enjoying ourselves. And then until that, you know, quarterfinal week, they tried to make, um, you know, things a bit difficult for us. But, uh, you know, it was not in their nature. They were obviously just trying to, you know, obviously support their team. So, you know, in the hotel we were staying and, you know, we started running out of food <laughs> and the Wi-Fi was not so great. And, and you know, it is, you know, things that weren't an issue before that. But I guess, you know, we, we kind of looked past that. And I think for myself, you know, the meaning of that quarterfinal week was just so much bigger because, you know, as you know, in 2015, you know, Japan, uh, you know, upset us in that first game. So I was kind of looking forward to making amends in that quarterfinal. There was obviously a few of us that played in that game in Brighton. So it was quite personal for me. So I was really psyched up and ready to, to obviously, uh, you know, go hard against the Japanese in that quarterfinal. Playing like a young man, playing like you were 22. The aging in reverse almost in that match, um, but unfortunately getting a yellow card. And as you're sitting, as you're sitting on that chair, talk me through it. Like, what, what are you thinking through those seconds, through those minutes? Hey, Mort, it was, it was uh, tough for me. It was the longest 10 minutes of my life. And, uh, you know, the fact that it matters that, you know, um, my record speaks for itself. You know, I've always been uh, quite a... A uh, disciplined player. I've never been uh, known for, you know, um, you know, obviously uh, illegal play or anything. So, you know, that was just me, you know, kind of trying to impose myself on the game. And I was so psyched up. I was so, you know, um, you know, ready to, to make an impact. And then when that guy ran towards me, all I wanted to do was drive him backwards. And then it ended up in a, in a tip tackle. So it was not my intention. And uh, thank God that Wade Barnes is a great referee. And he kind of, you know, made a good decision in the in the moment. And he could see that in my eyes I had remorse. And uh, I never intended to do that. He could see that, you know, that's what makes him a good, a great referee. And then, he, you know, he pulled out the yellow card. Because if they'd gone upstairs, you know, it could have been different. So I'm, I'm very grateful to, to the rugby, you know, the rugby gods. And, uh, yeah, obviously, and, and having a great referee that made the right call at the right moment. You could just see the way you threw your hands up almost immediately. You know, you just knew that, hey, it's about to be not a good time for me. 
a long, long <laughs> 10 minutes that she spent on the bench, but uh, the boys managing to, you know, contain the situation still. And then you get back on and it's back to the plan. Smash cream, but it wasn't a good halftime conversation. I- I've never heard Dwayne Vermeulen pissed off. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess you know, um, you know, the the that uh, quarterfinal um, was intense, uh, and uh, I think you know the you know like the Japanese brought their best, you know, the ultimate best, and then the crowd effect as well. So you know, I guess we got we didn't really get out, not rattled or anything, but we just got upset a little bit, and there was a bit of chat, you know, on the field where guys were, you know, maybe screaming at each other, and then that's what kind of obviously caused uh you know Dwayne to react that way because one of the things that we were trying to always um uh work on you know uh in the in the games that we played was always that to have um you know great communication to encourage each other and not necessarily you know say negative stuff if somebody makes a mistake you know rather pick them up than you know call them out for what they just done you know so yeah that was the whole thing you know positive talk you know not no negativity so that's what you know that's what that's what drove Dwayne to speak out and it actually made a huge impact because when we got into that second half everybody was on song and we just got back to what we were good at and we just batted away at the Japanese and uh, yeah they didn't know what hit them <laughs> yes so you did how deep do you have to go though as a player to find that place of composure no i think you you um you obviously go back to you know uh, what you trained uh for you know your processes and i think we had a a long preparation before the world cup on what exactly you know as a team what we wanted to uh you know achieve on the field what our processes were and there was no there was never a time when we felt like there was you know guys just going off on their own mission everybody was in song on one mission and that's what made us successful so i think it has to be ingrained in you uh mm. you know in your preparation you have to ingrain that in all the players you have to be all on song so that's why when you get to that stage of a quarter final and it's the heat of the moment you know that composure you know just comes in naturally i want to talk about mega mall but before <laughs> that there was that meeting that you guys had beers in the middle of the room when you walked in what did you think <laughs> oh yeah that was quite funny yeah. so you know obviously rashi kind of you know thought it would be a great idea you know to have a couple of uh beers in the in the, in the team room and just chat away about our more because you know our more is probably one of the biggest um uh you know um differences point of differences on the field of play for us you know as a spring box and we've always used it to to you know obviously impose ourselves on the opposition and it gives us great reward so he just thought you know we need to get back to our dna and we sat down and the beers obviously allowed guys to just be you know more free and just open up about exactly what they felt so yeah it was a bit of a shock you know i walked in there i'm like oh there's a lot of beers but uh in the end of the day you know we we kind of trained so hard that, uh, you know, a couple of beers didn't have any effect on us. But it actually helped us, you know, in, in, prepar- uh, in preparing for that quarterfinal. So, yeah, it obviously those beers actually ended up in us getting that, uh, whatever, 47 meter more and, um, you know, and getting that wonderful try. So I'm grateful for those beers. <laughs> Who made the call for the Mega Mall? Or did, uh, did you just find yourself <laughs> trudging along? No, the, the Mega Mall was called by uh, Sia. So Sia obviously makes the, you know, the calls. So he obviously um, uh, made that call uh, with with Andre. And then, uh, yeah, we just went for it. And we just, yeah, it was it was obviously a, a, a perfect mall and everything we trained for. Because uh, sometimes, you know, things just go wrong. You know, maybe that we get pulled down, but we just you know, pushed on for so long and uh, it worked out, you know. And, uh, yeah, I think it's probably, I think we probably broke some record, you know. I think there should be some record of the longest yeah. more ever. So that was pretty ridiculous. I was already on the bench, so I was just like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah, I love how, how uh, Malcolm describes it. It's like, all I'm seeing is white lines. Then I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We're still going. Oh. <laughs> Use once? No? Okay, let's continue. <laughs> because even Andre was like, I'm standing there, I'm like, they're still going. They're still going. 
they are still going. Um, but a great try in the end, a great assist from Malcolm Marx and Faf, uh, a just brilliant execution there in the end. How does it feel watching from the sideline when you see brilliant execution of the plan? Now, for me, it made me so happy. It, I was like on cloud 12. I was like somewhere there, up there, you know, and I was just so happy that the, the plan came together. And, yeah, I think I couldn't sit down, you know. I was just jumping up and down. And, yeah, it's something as a forward, I guess. It means it means much more than the backs because we have worked so hard for for so long, so many morning mm. sessions, and now that to see, you know, to see actually, you know, the rewards, you know, in a in a quarterfinal, ah, is just you know the most uh, amazing thing ever. So quarterfinal done and dusted. South Africa through to the last four, and you take on Wales, a team that seems unbeatable for a spell. That was the team that you just couldn't beat. Talk me through the prep for that. And was it more difficult than the Japan week? Um, I'd say, you know, that Welsh week was um, obviously quite exciting. You know, we were, we were super, you know, uh, excited to get in, in the semi final, And we knew that, you know, the, the Welsh were probably one of the toughest opposition that we had had, you know, in the last couple of years. And we, were, we would struggle to beat them. And uh, you know, one of the reasons why you know they've got they quite a strong uh, you know DNA in terms of the way they play, so they they would try and impose their game plan on you, because you know usually uh, you know most uh, teams want to play exciting rugby, want to score tries, but you know Wales kick a hell of a lot, and they're all about territory and uh, playing in the right places. So uh, you know they try and yeah, you know uh, bore you into submission. So most teams get impatient and they end up playing in the wrong areas and then they pounce, you know, then they get a turnover, then they score a quick, a quick try. And, uh, yeah, CC is on the... Oh, yeah, I just saw that. Shout out to the data. So, yeah, you know, so they, they obviously, you know, I've got this game plan that they try and pose on you. So we just knew that we have to stay patient. You know, Rossi drove it into us. The coaching staff drove it into us. And we, you know, we had great, you know, kickers and Faf and, um, and, uh, and Andre and, and Philly. So we just kind of, you know, worked on it the whole week. So our preparation was key, you know, to our success in that semifinal. But the discipline, because I, 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 it's like, oh, we're just itching for a try. We're just itching for a try. Oh, there's space. Oh, there's time. You know, how do you maintain that, 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 that discipline? How difficult was that for the team? I think it was quite it was quite difficult. I won't lie, because you know naturally, <laughs> CI is saying, uh, "What is he putting there? Chicken?" He says he's got food for you. He's got chicken for you. CI, uh, can I have some chicken too? Why are you only buying me chicken? I need chicken too. Okay. You know what? CI is, uh, is the face of Nando, so you got to eat Nando every every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay, uh, yeah. So, Going back here to uh, what you just asked now. What did you say? Ask now, sorry. The discipline. Just, just remaining and maintaining that discipline and not trying to let the, the, the itch or the urge to score those brilliant tries get the better of you. Oh, yes. No, it, it, it is definitely tough, you know, because I like naturally you want to play, you know, you want to, you see a gap, you want to take it. But that's what made uh, um, uh, probably Rossi so, you know, such a, you know, a big, point of difference as a coach for us because because he really, you know, taught us that discipline and, you know, made everybody buy into the plan, into the bigger plan and say, you know what, you don't want to just take the gap because, you know, individually you feel like it's on, but, you know, you compromise the team's, you know, um, the team's goals in the end. So, you know, that's why everybody just kind of, you know, kept, kept at it and stayed within the processes. And then eventually, you know, um, you know, we got the reward when Damien scored that try. And, uh, yeah, so it, it, it paid out, you know, in the end. So it's important to pay attention to detail and just make sure that everybody in the team, you know, buys into the plan. And, of course, the physicality, because you guys went out and just smashed. And every other, every other minute, there's a player coming off because you cannot stop smashing everybody. How much yeah. of a toll does that take on the body, but also mentally? What does it take to be that physical? Oh, I think it's the way we trained. 
I think C is trying to distract me. Yeah, he keeps on talking about food. He I see he is busy with that chicken. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna kick you out. I don't know how I'm gonna kick you out. Stop with the chicken. We are back here on the physicality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So I think you know, um, you know, naturally, that's you know, that's one thing in South Africans we have, you know, size, you know, and power. So I think you know, it's it's always been part of the DNA for the Springboks, and I think the way we train as well, you know, you know, we 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 are in the gym a hell of a lot, and our conditioning is based around building a lot of strength. So. Yeah, by the time, you know, we get on the field, you know, physically we we are bigger, we are stronger than, you know, a lot of, you know, the other teams out there. So I think the team at the World Cup, when you look at it, you know, most of the guys were the, you know, the, the, the prime, you know, you look at a guy like Bongi, he's a monster, you know, he, he was probably one of, the, he's probably one of the most physical physical players that I've ever, you know, played with. You know, he was just like hungry to go out there and, and, and kill somebody. So, you know, when you have players like that, you know, they're just willing to, to put their bodies in the line and just, you know, work hard for the team. You know, it makes that much of a difference, you know, in, in you getting the results. So that's what happened. We just became such a physical team. And in our forwards play to our strength, our scrum and our moves. And the results just started off coming our way. But uh, yeah, I think you know the 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 recipe to our success was in our conditioning. It's also a game where the all heads really, really stood up, and it was great to see Francois Law out on the park, and with that steal, that game changing steal, might I add. Um, he's also now retired. What have you thought of his of his career, but particularly his time in Japan and the and the work he put in? To, to, to be part of this team, but also to make a difference in that way, both on and off the field? Yep, now I've got huge, huge respect for, for, for Flo Low Low, as we call him. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, you know Flo was yeah, such a, you know, uh, uh, an amazing guy in terms of, like, you know, accepted his role in the team. And, uh, you know, I know Flo that, you know, he's probably one of the players that that could have easily just started, you know, being been in the starting lineup and his intelligence, you know, in terms of knowing uh, you know, about the game and, you know, um just knowing how to to outsmart opposition is is totally um uh incredible. You know, he's been around for many years and I played I played uh, against him <laughs> since we we're under nineteen, so I know him very well. So, <laughs> so you know, to see him mature into the player he became was just, uh, you, know, you know, quite um, you know, amazing for me. And I respect him highly. And the effect that he had, you know, on that World Cup team was immense. You know, he brought along a lot of um, good, you know, information because he was playing in the UK at Bath. So he knew a lot of the players, you know, in Europe. You know, when we played against the Welsh, when we played against England, he knew these players really well. So he added a lot of value. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on top of his play, you know, he was adding a lot of value in terms of our preparation. So, you know, for him to make that 10 over was just probably, uh, you know, just just uh, one of the results of, you know, the, the hard work he's put into the game. And he, he, he deserves the accolades that have come his way. He deserves the praise because, you know, I think he's one guy who could have just, you know, been in the starting lineup. And for him to, to, to kind of, you know, Turn around that that semi final and actually get us that victory. Um, yeah, I think yeah we owe it to him. You know, salute to 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 uh, to Flo Lolo for doing that for us. Yeah, and then comes the line out penalty off of the line out, and Andre Pollard has to step on one more time. Um, and Billy Larue describes it perfectly in 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 the episode as well. Where he says he just couldn't look, he couldn't look. He was too afraid. He looked up and then he looked down. What was it like? on the bench for you guys, just waiting for that kick. Could you look? Uh, I could look. <laughs> I usually do look because I don't want anything to pass me by. But I know that the guys were struggling, you know, um, you know, their, their eyes closed. But I know for me, yeah, you know, it was just uh, uh, nerve-wracking, you know, kind of stuff. And I couldn't really sit down. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I knew that Hundre is, is the kind of player that can, you know, take that that penalty, you know, and uh, kick it over because he's just got that big match temperament. You know, he's a mm. he's a big player for big games. So I had all the faith in him, and I knew that he was going to get it over. 
So when he did, uh, yeah, I was yeah I was jumping up and down. I think we were all ecstatic and uh, just happy to you know get a chance to compete in the final. But what what did you feel in that moment? Was it more relief than happiness? Ah, uh, jeez, I think it was more relief than anything. <laughs> it was definitely more relief. You know, like I said, you know, the Welsh. Uh, you know they've given us a hard time for a long, you know for many years, mm. and uh, you know they've been hard to beat for us. So, for you know this, it was like a it was a it was a heavyweight boxing match for us. You know, you know, and then in the end we we literally just you know peeped over you know Wales and and took it. And uh, yeah, I think yeah it was relief, <laughs> definitely relief. Do you think a documentary like Chasing the Sun because of the way it puts the preparation, the work, the, the behind the scenes frustrations and, and everything that the player goes through. Do you think it gives the fans a better perspective of where you guys are and how it is to win a World Cup? Certainly. Um, I think it's, it's an amazing project. And I think um, more of these uh, documentaries need to be made because you know, uh, fans and, you know, people in general need to actually understand what actually go, goes on behind the scenes, you know, what makes a team successful, you know. Um, and I think, you know, for, for everything to be documented the, the way it was, you know, um, you know with uh, somebody in camp all the whole time and just recording, you know, a lot of footage is just, it, it's, it's something that is priceless, you know, for, for you know, maybe a young kid that's out there, in the township and he gets to actually see, you know, what, what, what makes you successful? What, you know, what is the ingredients that you need, you know, to, to get to the top is something that is, you know, priceless and it's going to impact a lot of, you know, people out there and just, you know, show them that, you know, no matter where you're from, you can reach the eyes of greatness. And I think this documentary needs to be put on, on Netflix because a lot of people, that are you know not in the country um, have been asking me uh, how do we get to watch this because yeah it is something really special it's been done in an amazing way so I'm just yeah I'm I'm so grateful that I'm a part of it and I hope that you know this carries on for for you know many many more years yeah I'm sure leaders at your world are champions are already working on that how to syndicate it to the rest of the world because it is creating quite the buzz. You speak about, you know, what builds a team and what makes a team great. What do you think made the Springboks great in 2019? No, I think um, what made what made the Springboks in 2019 great is is the fact that we all bought into, you know, one one plan, you know, one vision, and uh, obviously the the mastermind behind that was Rassi. You know, he took the, you know, that leadership role. Uh, he took it seriously, and the first thing he knew was very important was get to get everybody aligned and uh, you know and going in one direction. And I think the journey started in 2018. It just didn't start in 2019. Yeah, you know, it started in 2018 with those English tests, uh, those three English tests, and the incoming tour. And you know everything was just being paved. You know at that moment we went on this journey. And I remember in that first, uh, you know, team meeting that we had in the first camp, Rossi had like, you know, he had a, um, a presentation that he showed to everybody, like with, with the amount of games that we were going to play towards the World Cup final. And each game was, a, you know, a step towards the World Cup final. So we knew from the onset that we were working to, to get to that final and win it. So the vision was there and we just all started working towards it. And he was, he was brutally honest and said that we're probably going to lose games along the way. But the fact that it matters is that we know the bigger picture is that we want to win the World Cup. So, you know, that was ingrained in us, you know, um, earlier on. And then, you know, thankfully the squad stayed together. You know, we're predominantly the same guys playing together. So we got to know each other very well. And yeah, we pushed each other. Everybody was honest with, with each other. And uh, yeah, and then we just kept on, you know, working hard, improving every single day. And uh, yeah, it was it was a case of where Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, we just we built this this you know this um, this success along the way, step by step. So you know, my advice to to people that want to make it and do great things is that you have to have a you know a, a step by step kind of process, step by step kind of plan where you, you know, work on yourself, write down your goals, know exactly what you want to achieve, what's your end vision. 
So, you know, and then work towards that and have that alignment. Everybody, you know, everybody buy into the plan and work towards it. So I think, yeah, for me, that was the biggest difference. I learned so many lessons along the way, you know, and uh, it was just, yeah, truly amazing, you know. So great to, you know, to end my career on the highest of highs like that. Highest of highs indeed. When did you start to believe? When did you really believe that you are going to win the World Cup? I, I think when we beat uh, New Zealand uh, in uh, in 2018 in Wellington, that's when that's when the belief um, uh, yeah. came. And I think you know before that we obviously had lost Australia and Argentina, and you know winning that game you know gave us so much so much confidence and so much uh, you know hope that we. We knew we could actually do it because New Zealand, obviously, we know at the time they were number one in the world, you know, and they'd won so many games, you know, in, in New Zealand. And, you know, we beat them there. And, yeah, it, it gave us a lot of uh, wind in our sails. Yeah. How has winning the World Cup changed your life? Ah, <laughs> oh, geez. No, it's, uh, it's done the world of wonders for me. Uh, firstly, obviously, I achieved my my life long dream uh of of you know holding that William Williams trophy and the reason why I played rugby for so long, you know, um I think yeah, for me it just yeah, I came full circle, you know, when 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 uh, we won that World Cup and I could, you know, retire with a smile on my face because one of my ambitions was always to leave the the jersey in a better place. So I did that and that's what made me, you know, uh, feel complete and feel content about moving on to the next chapter. And then obviously now, uh, you know, g getting into the business world, you know, uh, when being a World Cup champion opens a lot of doors. You know, a lot of yeah. people want, want to be associated with, with champions. And I've mm -hmm. actually, um, I've, I've gotten to meet people that probably I wouldn't have met if I hadn't won the World Cup. So, uh, you know, I've, I've made great uh, relationships and connections for the future. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just, yeah, grateful for that and hopefully inspired, you know, um, yeah, many, many young people out there to to go out there and chase their dreams, you know, because ultimately for me, the biggest thing is to impact lives, you know, and change lives because, yeah, you know, that's that's why I'm here, you know, that's why I'm here to to inspire and uh, yeah. Just be thoroughly deserved. Yeah. <laughs> thoroughly deserved. <laughs> no, Rusty speaks a lot you. about, you know, trying to change the psyche of our country, carrying the people of South Africa in your heart. But I imagine you also carry the people of, of your home, Zimbabwe. In fact, maybe even the continent, because for so many, you are an embodiment and, and a brilliant example of how, you can come from anywhere in the world and be the best in the world. How has that been to, to, to carry the hopes of hundreds of millions? For me, it's been, it's been a privilege. It's been a, you know, a massive privilege that I've never taken for, for granted, you know, um, at any stage in my career, you know, it only pushed me to work harder because I knew I was representing, you know, others on the biggest stage. So that's why I couldn't let them down. And you know, the fact that you say that, you know, I was born in Zimbabwe, yes, it was always, you know, in me. Um, it was always with me, you know, that I want to, you know, inspire young people out there from the continent, you know, just not just Zimbabwe, from, from everywhere, you know, across the continent, young people that, you know, probably are, you know, in, in difficult circumstances and they just don't, think that they can get out of it, they can't become great, they can't achieve their dreams. I felt like I was carrying that, you know, that that torch for them to to show them that you can, you know, you can become the best, no matter where you're from. You know, you can become a you know a, a, yeah, in a story of inspiration and change the world literally, you know, and and do great things, you know. So I, that's what I felt, you know, on my journey, that I couldn't let down that young kid you know, somewhere in, in, in a township that has got a dream and he, you know, he, he probably doesn't have, you know, doesn't have much and he thinks, you know, 
the world is a tough place. But, you know, that was what I felt that, I, you know, I was carrying with me the whole time. So I'm just, yeah, I'm hopefully, I'm hopefully one day, you know, there's a kid out there that makes it. And, you know, you say that Beast inspires me, you know, um, you know when, when he played. So that was probably one thing that I was after throughout my career. You carry it with so much grace, so much grace. You are extraordinary, Tendai. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, what an extraordinary career it has been for the Sharks and for the Springboks as well. And I am so glad that God bestowed you the honor of bowing out on such a high. It, it, it is extraordinary. The fairy tale of 2019, I, I can't get over it. It is absolutely amazing. Congratulations on all you've achieved on the field. I can't wait to see what you're doing off the field as well. And all the best in your work with your foundation. No, thank you very much, Mort. It's great to chat to you. So it was an honor. And one more time for the B. <laughs> Have a wonderful, wonderful night. And uh, yeah, I, I know you're going to be in front of your screen again next week for the final, final episode of Chasing the Sun. Thank you for joining us. Mwah. Good night. Thanks, Mort. None other than Tendai Beast Mtawarira joining us here on our coverage of Chasing the Sun. We've been uh, speaking to some of the players after every single episode, which, which are airing on Sunday and have been for the last four weeks. So next week, it is the final episode. Next week is the moment where we get to relive the 2nd of November 2019, the day that South Africa became world champions for a third time in their history. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Thank you for showing uh, the Beast so much love. They worked their socks off um, to make sure that they put the green and gold on the world map once again. Thank you for engaging. And we're back next week, Sunday, quarter past seven, uh, as we close this up. Chasing the Sun has been extraordinary. Make sure that uh, you check out the final episode next week uh, on Mnet at six o'clock, channel 101. And I am sure, I am sure, guys, that our team is working extra time to make sure that this um, documentary is beamed to everybody around the world. Have yourself a lovely Sunday night from myself, Motilisi Mohono. Good night. <laughs>